Hello and uh, welcome to us talking again about guidelines and uh, this is going to be a, one of those uh, conversations that will be explaining some of the new BSR guidelines that are on the website and uh, in the journal obviously. My name is Mawan Bakari, I'm a rheumatologist in the Northwest and I'm the editor-in-chief of the journal and here to discuss them with me uh, we've got uh, some established members uh, of the guidelines group who will tell us a bit about themselves and their interests. So shall we start with Karen? Yeah, thank you, Marwan. So my name is Karen Schreiber. I'm a clinical specialist trainee in rheumatology. I'm also associate professor at the Southern Danish University and affiliated to St. Thomas's in London. And I've been part of the first guideline back in 2016 and now of the updated guideline as well. OK, Claire? Hi, yeah, I'm Claire. I've got rheumatoid arthritis and I was the patient, one of the patient representative um, on the group. OK, uh, Mark? Hello there. Uh, so I'm uh, Mark Russell. I'm an NOHR doctoral fellow and rheumatology specialty registrar at King's College London. And my primary role was to lead on the uh, evidence search and systematic review for the immunomodulatory prescribing guideline. OK, and Ian. Uh, thanks, Marwan. Uh, my name is Ian Giles. I'm an academic rheumatologist based at University College London Hospitals and University. Uh, with an interest in managing patients with obstetric rheumatic disease in pregnancy and was the lead for the guideline. Okay, well, we'll start off really by exploring things. So the big and important question, um, why do we need these guidelines? Ian, what do you think? Well, that's a, a key question. And I think it, it's really important for our patients and members because uh, we deal with inflammatory, many different inflammatory rheumatic diseases that have to have a predilection for women and can affect them during their reproductive years. So management of these conditions during pregnancy is a topic that frequently arises during routine consultations. Uh, and if it doesn't, it should be arising more often and is something that could be factored into regular annual reviews. But of course, the issue of managing conditions in pregnancy is fraught with complications because of a general fear of prescribing medications in pregnancy. And in fact, there's good evidence from maternal monitoring studies that are called the EMBRAE studies that happen in the general population in the UK, that much of the harm that happens to women in general in pregnancy is through stopping medications unnecessarily. And that's something that we don't want to happen in our patients with rheumatic disease. So having a comprehensive guideline dissecting the wealth of evidence or, or lack of evidence, but then supporting that with uh, expert opinion on when medications can be used uh, gives great support and confidence to both our members, healthcare professionals and patients when it comes to having conversations around the use of these drugs in pregnancy. And it really has been shown to be an unmet need from surveys that have been done off the workforce. So I think our guidelines serve a very useful purpose there. OK, that's great. So, uh, Mark, can you tell us what's new and what's different and can you give us some examples? Well, so, so previously in the 2016 version of the guidelines, there was a part one that covered uh, prescribing of immunomodulatory drugs in pregnancy and then a part two. Uh, that covered uh, prescribing medications for treatment of comorbidities during pregnancy. Um, the volume of evidence, the number of drugs has increased considerably since the last version of the guideline. So we've now entirely separated these uh, two guidelines uh, in the latest version. And we took a, a different approach for, uh, for both uh, versions of those guidelines. So for the immunomodulatory prescribing guideline, we performed a full systematic literature search uh, to look at uh, all the evidence uh, that is uh, sort of accumulated since the 2016 version and then formulated our recommendations based upon all that uh, uh, all that data. Um, uh, sort of quite different from the last version of the guideline is that we didn't limit our literature search to uh, just studies performed in rheumatic diseases. So we also considered evidence from other relevant conditions, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, uh, where relevant. Um, uh, and we took a bit of a different approach for, for prescribing uh, medication, the, the guideline on prescribing medications for comorbidity. So we, we recognize that, for example, prescribing uh, for, for hypertension in pregnancy has already been covered in uh, a considerable number of other guidelines and high quality systematic reviews. So our approach for, for this was to look for the highest level of available evidence out there. So if there was already a high quality systematic review or other guidelines, then we took that into consideration. If there wasn't, then we looked for uh, the largest available cohort studies or case series uh, on which to base our um, recommendations. But I think it's important to say that for both 
the immunomodulatory guideline and the comorbidity prescribing guideline, the key questions were the same. So um, is the medication compatible with pregnancy? Should it be stopped uh, in advance of conception? Uh, is it compatible uh, with breastfeeding? And then uh, also, is it compatible with paternal exposure? Uh, uh, and we have, for, for, from the, the sort of the practical perspective, we have an executive summary that brings together all our recommendations and then a full guideline, full version of the guideline that uh, um, it, it sort of gives all the supporting evidence behind that. And I think if we were to pick out uh, a couple of the big changes from the previous um, version of the guideline, well, I think one that sort of stands out is that for methotrexate, previously we'd said that that should be stopped at least three months in advance of trying to conceive. Uh, we now recognise that there's um, increasing evidence to show that perhaps a three-month window is longer than we need. So in the latest version of the, um, in, in the current iteration, we say that it needs to be stopped uh, at least a month uh, in advance uh, of trying to conceive. Uh, and then we also, for example, there's a, a much larger body of evidence now supporting the use or the safe use of anti-TNF uh, medications during pregnancy. And so, for example, uh, in the current iteration, we, we say that the evidence supports the safe use of anti-TNFs during breastfeeding. Uh, and then we also give specific uh, sort of time thresholds uh, as to when ideally we would um, uh, stop their use in uh, later stage pregnancy uh, or pause their use in later stage pre pregnancy. Uh, but importantly, we say that if they are required throughout pregnancy, then uh, that can be uh, done in consultation with your clinician. OK, that's great. So that sounds as though there is quite a bit more and there's two big parts of it. And the executive summary is something that the rheumatologist will be able to take and give to the patient. Um, is it available as a table uh, or as a handout that you can ha you can have? Yeah, so absolutely. So both in both the executive summary and in the full guideline, there is a uh, there's a quick reference table that sort of gives you sort of relatively brief yes no whether they're safe at the, in answering those different questions I mentioned before so compatible with pregnancy etc and then there are some uh, slightly bigger uh, evidence summary tables um, that uh, give a, 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 a sort of slightly less quick reference but where they're what the body of evidence behind those recommendations are. Okay great. So, Karen, um, can you tell us a bit really about how this guideline actually differs from ACR and EULA guidelines? Uh, I'm sure that there's been other ones and other national ones elsewhere. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, I can. So, um, um, in terms of what our guidelines cover, we, we do cover slightly more drugs than um, both the ACR but also the EULA guideline. And um, uh, from what we've heard in terms of feedback from both colleagues, but also from patients or other healthcare professionals, is that the uh, guidelines that, the B, that we produce under the BSR are quite user friendly. And Mark was mentioning that. So we usually have a table where we actually show um, the compatibility with per periconception and with each trimester separated. And most importantly, also with paternal exposure, whether a drug is safe to use um, when, a father, when, a, when a man wants to father a child. And again, that's also a difference to both the EULA also and also, I know the ACR probably covers it, EULA does not, uh, but we do. And um, in terms of what uh, differs to the previous guidelines, we've certainly grown as a working group. And um, so, so we're, we're a huge expert team uh, having produced these guidelines. And um, yeah, the drugs we covering, so previously we covered roughly 52 drugs, and now we've increased that to 71 drugs. Um, the new drug, drugs that we include in the guidelines are um, colchicine, dapsone, but also we have a statement on oral anticoagulants. Um, and I think these were probably the most important differences and updates. Okay. So... If you, if you look at it, so this is a more comprehensive and more user-friendly guideline. Um, so let's, uh, let's ask about patients. So Claire, um, what do you think, how, what will, does this mean for patients um, with rheumatic diseases and rheumatoid arthritis, for example? Well, I think whenever you're managing a, a health condition, then information is power, really. Um, and these guidelines are for health professionals, but also, as we mentioned, there's some really useful summary tables and handouts that can be helpful for patients as well. So it means that when you're choosing which medication to go on, if you're thinking about having children at some point, you can start having these discussions as early as you like, really. Um, so, you know, if it's something that you're considering in the near future, you might move on to drugs that can be um, 
continued or for a certain amount of time through pregnancy so that you're kind of ready when you then do decide that you want to start planning a pregnancy. Um, everyone's obviously always well, concerns and worries and kind of wanting to make sure their body and their, their baby is as healthy as possible. Um, so these guidelines really help give people the information to make those plans and make those decisions together with their health professionals. Okay, that's great. So the patients will benefit from this, but recently we've had a difference in how we, prescri- I've been told of a difference in how we prescribe hydroxychloroquine and the, the British National Formula, I understand, has, has been slightly altered uh, the, uh, to, to reflect this. Ian, how does this influence things? So what ch- do changes in, prescri- in, 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 in inserts from drugs make a difference to, to what you've published? <coughs> So it, it's always the case that there's evolving information, uh, and of course, that's there's there's always a need to update guidelines because new information emerges, primarily from the sort of you know the evidence base which informs the recommendations that are made. Uh, in the case of regulatory bodies, and it's actually it's the EMA in this case that have made a slight alteration to the patient insert for hydroxychloroquine uh, earlier this year that has caused a lot of conversation in the um, expert community working in the field of obstetric rheumatology uh, that I think is the basis of your question. And so it's it's a good one to think about because what, what the EMA has looked at is on the basis of one large uh, study, which we did actually also consider in the BSR guideline as well, which showed uh, a potential concern for uh, congenital malformation with hydroxychloroquine, but only at high dose, well above the dosage used to manage patients with rheumatic disease in pregnancy. They did not see the same signal of harm at the lower doses, which corresponds with the range that we use to manage rheumatic disease in pregnancy. And because hydroxychloroquine is one of our go-to drugs for various forms of inflammatory arthritis, but particularly for other types of autoimmune rheumatic disease like lupus, for instance, uh, this is something that can potentially cause a lot of concern because the way the regulatory agency has altered the wording is is quite blunt. Uh, and it says basically you were phrases like avoid, uh, avoid this drug in pregnancy unless you your doctor considers the benefits outweigh the risks, which is a very strong and negatively worded statement. So there are many reasons why uh, people uh, in the obstetric rheumatology field have sort of taken uh, exception to it. And there are various news pieces that I think have already appeared on the BSR website and hopefully a letter that will appear in rheumatology soon. Uh, And also Karen, who might want to speak on this topic, has been leading uh, a larger European uh, group with a letter to appear in another journal. Uh, are basically outlining why we think it's a rather extreme representation of views. And whilst we're not disagreeing with the evidence itself, we're asking for perhaps a more nuanced uh, way of presenting information. Okay, Karen. So, just uh, y- y- from the perspective of the campaign, I mean, if if you if you've already, it's good that you've seen exactly the same evidence that the EMA has done, and the EMA also saw the same evidence the FDA did and came up with a very different answer for jacket inhibitors. How are you going to take this forward? Um, so, I think one of the most uh, important steps to to take is actually to have an active conversation with the EMA about this and um, we we, as an example the pediatric oncology world uh, have been invited uh, to have expert physicians sitting in the PRAC teams which I think is an absolute it's absolutely necessary and I, I would hope that this would happen to to rheumatologists with an interest in pregnancy as well because I think at, it, somehow we should sit at the table and 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 be part of making the wording or making the recommendations because we as clinicians have a very unique understanding of how subtle wording can change or make create fears for, uh, in patients so um we are in conversation with the EMA, uh, with the PRAC members, and uh, I hope that at some point we, we will be able to engage with them um, in a more direct way. That would be my hope. <laughs> okay. Yes. 
Right. And finally, Mark, you, you did all the literature search. Have there been any gaps that have been uncovered? Do you think that there's anything people will, anybody who wants to be looking at, at pregnancy and rheumatic diseases will want to be researching? So I think the biggest gap uh, would be um, looking at targeted synthetic DMARD. So we did consider that we searched for evidence for um, uh, JAK inhibitors uh, in particular, given they are increasingly prescribed. And there is very little data uh, on prescribing JAKs in pregnancy, which made formulating um, uh, recommendations on them very difficult. So we, 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 you know, if you read the guidelines, you'll see that it's very hard on the basis of available evidence to sort of provide uh, statements on those. And these, of course, aren't uh, the same as monoclonal antibodies, where we can sort of extrapolate how they might uh, be, be handled during pregnancy. These are small molecules with the, uh, much more potential to cross the placenta. And so I, th I think that's bearing in mind how much they are prescribed uh, or increasingly prescribed. That would be a key, key area uh, going forward. So looking at observational data, for example, to see how safe are they uh, during prescribing, during breastfeeding, which are increasingly relevant questions. Okay. Um, Claire, as a, as a patient, what do you think you would have wanted to see a bit more of? Um, I think one of the things that Ian mentioned actually is really important and could be studied further, which is the benefits sometimes of continuing medication um, in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if someone's arthritis isn't particularly well controlled, or in my case, mine was very well controlled, and when my medication was stopped, I had a spectacular flare, which we probably couldn't have foreseen. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of having that freedom to continue drugs safely, I think is really important as a choice as a patient and a, and a health professional to have that. And um, there just isn't much research on that for certain medications at the moment. Um, so something in that area would be really kind of reassuring, I think, for some patients. So if you, so Ian, if there's somebody sort of like new to the subject of, 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 of obstetric rheumatology, where would you want to direct their energies? Where would they want to go and how can they get involved? Well, they could uh, join the, the BSR special interest group. That would, would be one way to go, certainly from UK based members. Uh, we try and have a presence at the conference each year since 2019. We've been proposing various sessions, some within the sort of SIG format, but also some in the main conference session as well, uh, so that people can certainly attend sessions and hear about latest research and developments there. That's one way to get involved. Um, there are wider sort of European networks as well. So I think. Uh, and also looking at their local centres because there's been an expansion of maternal medicine networks. Uh, so the obstetric medicine field itself is expanding. And this is an area that I think is increasingly going to be overlapping with rheumatology in terms of experience that people can gain through training, perhaps by having to take out of programme experience. But still, if you can <laughs> dual certify in obstetric medicine and rheumatology, then I think you will have a very unique skill set it will make you very attractive to future employers. So something to uh, for the younger members of the audience to think about for sure. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. So any other comments that you would want to make um, to go with the guideline? And uh, congratulations on, on the new update. Uh, when's the next one due is the next question. Actually, on that topic, uh, another hat that I wear is the uh, chair of the the standard audit and guidelines working group for BSR, so overseeing all of the guidelines, is that uh, we're going to sort of thinking about moving along the lines with NICE, who are changing their process to make living guidelines, whereby that if if a guideline, a little bit of it just needs changing five years down the line, then rather than redo the whole process, you just change the little bit that needs changing. And I think that's something that we may well be moving towards with BSR guidance. Uh, and so we can perhaps just have a mini a mini review of certain topics five years down the line. OK, uh, right. Well, thank you very much and thank you for contributing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.